Welcome to another exciting episode of Wimplo News. Today we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Thomas Wiesner, who's going to be sharing a lot of important information about the security concerns associated with blockchain and cryptocurrency. So without any further ado, let's go forward with this interview. Okay. So Mr. Thomas, uh, greetings. Welcome to Wimplo News. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful day. So uh, to begin with, could you please introduce about yourself and how you got involved with blockchain and your journey so far? Absolutely. So um, hi, my name is Thomas. Um, I'm the founder of thinkingassets.com and we provide blockchain education. I've started my journey in 2012 uh, where Bitcoin really took off a little bit. Um, but at that time, I, I was not invested in Bitcoin. My former employee tried to pay me, but I was a student and I desperately needed cash money. So no crypto portfolio, not got rich. Um, in, uh, fast forward in 2016, I uh, became aware of a platform called Ethereum and smart contracts. So I found it extremely interesting uh, because with these smart contracts, you can uh, put business models of corporations onto the blockchain <clears throat> and make use of all the great benefits of a blockchain has at, at a very little cost. So this is where I, I got really stuck with uh, blockchain and I tried to educate uh, people all around the globe uh, about blockchain technologies and it's been a great pleasure so far. It's been a lot of fun. Amazing. Uh, that's very insightful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so to get started, so you seem to be teaching at Udemy, if I'm not wrong. So what exactly is the profile of uh, most of the students um, who subscribe to the program? Like, What's the background like? Yeah, um, so yes, uh, it's true. Um, myself and uh, Ravinda, we are teaching uh, on Udemy um, about blockchain technologies, mostly developer courses, hands-on. Um, it's also the largest audience we serve there with about 120,000 students and those are mostly uh, self-taught uh, people who want to advance in their career or start a new career. Mm -hmm. So it's less corporate trainings, it's less team trainings that uh, we see there. Um, it's mostly people who come there who really want to learn about blockchain technologies themselves um, and then uh, either apply it or just put it uh, as a new entry on their CV, which is a, a very good uh, thing to do. Um, it's actually interesting because the second largest audience that we have on Udemy is from India. So I, I think there's a huge demand there. Oh, that's good to know. I, uh, I I feel that blockchain has become a, a big thing here in India. A lot of people are curious to know more about it. And uh, there seems to be a lot of startups uh, who focus primarily on implementing blockchain technology uh, to solve a lot of problems. So. Uh, I guess the future has a lot in store for all of us. Yeah, um, I think so too. I, I think it's a, it's been a great journey so far. And I think there's, we're just still early adopters. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. That's wonderful news. So uh, on to the next question. Um, can you name some key corporate training assignments um, that you have with some of the top blockchain companies? Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, the way we are doing corporate trainings with uh, with corporations is different than we do it with Udemy. In Udemy, you have this uh, video on demand courses, self taught, where you walk through a project. And with corporations, you have more uh, classic corporate in person training where we go on site and we train smaller teams in groups and we really try to tailor it towards their business needs. Um, what we do there, we have assignments which range from architecturing business workflows to implementing uh, infrastructure layers and, and try to provide them the knowledge that they have the right governance in place. Um, we also try to answer fundamental questions like uh, how can we use uh, transactional data where we have payments and merge this together with operational data where it comes to supply chains or uh, inventory control or fraud management. So those are uh, those fundamental things we try to answer in those labs, in those assignments. And we run these labs with uh, different uh, corporations or even universities now. Uh, everything from very small ones to Fortune 500s or even governments. 
And um, I think the, the most interesting thing is that it was always eye-opening what you can actually do with blockchains outside of cryptocurrency. So that has been a lot of fun and it was always well received. Yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, I think it does. Uh, I think, okay. yeah, <laughs> that's all right. So uh, actually this, uh, the next question is about uh, Mt. Gox. So, um, for all the viewers who are unaware of this, uh, Mt. Gox was one of the leading uh, Bitcoin exchange platforms uh, from Tokyo, Japan. And in uh, February 2014, uh, the, the, the platform uh, lost over 800,000 uh, Bitcoins amounting to more than $450 million. So ever since this incident happened, I believe uh, the blockchain community of the cryptocurrency uh, market has never been the same. So since this incident, uh, how far do you think the community has evolved uh, regarding the security of uh, digital currency? And what's your opinion on this? Uh, I think I think Mt. Gox and uh, Capellas, who was running Mt. Gox at the time, were really super early, early the earliest of the early adopters, um, providing uh, exchange for cryptocurrencies. And I think there was no uh, standard procedures in place at the time. I've, I've never used Mt. Gox myself, so I cannot really comment on how the user experience was or how the perceived security was on that side. But I know a lot of people who lost a lot of money on that exchange. Uh, and I think they're going to pay out soon, maybe, um, if uh, they're um, bankruptcy claims are going through. Uh, I, I believe that um, through those uh, mistakes that happened in the past, a lot of people learned from it, uh, both people who want to run the exchanges uh, as well as regulators who want to uh, regulate and test and, and see that people can trust in the money that they put onto those exchanges. So, uh, I mean, in general, hacks can happen. Uh, and if you run an exchange, you have to have risk management in place. You have to be prepared that um, somebody drains funds and you have to have a, a plan, a mitigation plan for that in place. You can either go bankrupt or you can come out even stronger. I mean, it's not the best example, but I think Bitfenix came out much stronger after their hack uh, where they issued their own coin and just got people hooked up as an investment into their own um, into their own exchange, into their own platform. So I think, I hope the community evolved and learned a lot. And I think regulators are necessarily stepping in and saying like, hey guys, there's millions of people's money involved. Uh, let's do this right, but don't do it at all. That's a nice answer, actually. Uh, I feel that there's a lot of learning uh, to actually, there's a lot of experience that can be taken out of this incident uh, for uh, the blockchain tech, uh, exchange platforms are going to come out in the future, and uh, I believe it's been a it's been a huge learning experience to a lot of people who were involved. Unfortunately, to some of them who've actually lost uh, several bit of funds through the incident. But I, like any other industry, I think uh, it just goes through uh, the ups and downs. And uh, so. Uh, this being said, my next question is also s about another scandal that has happened recently. It's about the Quadriga CX exchange incident. So, in your opinion, how do you think these exchanges can prepare fully to address the safety of uh, investors? Um, is there a certain approach that these exchange platforms can put in place? Um, uh I, I also have not used the uh, Quadriga exchange uh, myself, but from what I read and from what I see, I think the governance and management of Quadriga exchange was handled really poorly. Um, the way I understood it, it's like uh, running a bank and only the bank manager owns the key to the vault or even worse. And then he goes missing and every, all the money is gone. So that definitely should not happen. Um, from a, a general standpoint, there are some basic disciplines that you have to have in place in order to run a company successfully. That is uh, something like risk management, how you handle the money, fiscal and asset management, legal and compliance, and um, in that case also governance and management of the platform and investors' money. Uh, you can't just uh, put everything onto the bank owner's hands and think that everything will be fine. 
So there's these basic rules to follow. And uh, in Quadriga's exchanges uh, place, this was clearly not the case. Um, the other thing which I think is uh, lacking in the market is education. And um, people do not get the idea right that uh, strong cryptography and uh, with the benefits and drawbacks of strong cryptography, there is no lost password functionality. If you lose your keys, you lose access to your funds. It can be the biggest benefit or in that case, the biggest drawback. So you have to have some management in place to avoid losing your funds, uh, especially when it's not yours, but your investors. Ah, I think that's pretty fair. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for answering that uh, clearly for us. Um, so somewhere similar uh, along the similar lines. So there has been an increasing number of uh, fake wallet apps recently on Google Play Store. And um, a lot of people have actually been falling prey to uh, these scandals and these uh, fake applications. So according to you, uh, what could be the measures that users or investors could take uh, from falling prey to such breaches? Well, uh, in, in one word, I think it's education. Um, if you think about it, we are at the brink of a new area. Uh, we have, normally we have banks uh, issuing credit cards or bank accounts, and now you're issuing it to yourself. Um, and that happens with those wallets. And if you don't know how this actually works, uh, then you can fall prey to the, such breaches. It's totally new and it needs some education. It actually reminds me very much of the early days where people bought phones on eBay and then they got bricks instead. So it took some time in order that the market catches up, the people learned from it. Uh, uh, they, they were educating themselves uh, where to look for the right things in order that this can or should not happen. And um, at the end, I think that the benefits will outnumber uh, the drawbacks. And at the end, I hope nobody will talk about uh, a few people trying to make a quick money uh, providing these fake wallet apps. And um, I think there will be some standard applications that can come out as, uh, as things that you will use. It's almost like email. Uh, if if you think of email, you receive phishing emails and spam emails, but you would you would just see that as a as a bad side effect. It's not the main uh, drawback of using email these days that there's phishing. Uh, I think the lack of education is uh, one of the major reasons for all this. And since we are also on um, a technological transition, um, I believe these kind of things happen with the. Uh, with the beginning of the internet and uh, since we are uh, looking into a new transition now these things are bound to happen but uh, obviously it does not overshadow the benefits and the the value that it would add to everyone's life in the near future so um, i think uh, that's something that we get to start adapting to and uh, getting more aware of so uh, thank you for that uh, so my next question uh, if you don't mind is uh, can data science concepts like deep packet sniffing uh, be used to prevent security compromises? And uh, if so, why do you feel that? Deep package sniffing. I'm, I'm, it's a good question. I can't give you a 100% correct answer on that. I believe my background is artificial intelligence, machine learning and blockchain development. I think to answer that question 100% correct, you would need to talk to someone with a strong network security background. But as far as I know, uh, deep packet sniffing, or it's also got deep packet uh, inspection, I think, yes. is looking if a package, uh, uh, a network package contains a virus or uh, something malicious uh, on the protocol level. And um, my thought on that is that it can't prevent uh, all security compromises, uh, as you can compromise security on many different levels. On the other hand, if you look at a blockchain where data inherently isn't trusted um, and every transaction and every single block has to prove itself over and over again uh, before it's added as a valid block, um, it might even make uh, deep package inspection completely obsolete. So that's maybe just without even thinking what exactly deep packet, uh, deep packet inspection does, maybe it's not even necessary to think about it. Ah, okay, uh, but thank you for that. Thank you uh, for your uh, 
uh, valuable insights. Uh, I think that could be helpful to some of our viewers. Uh, so moving on to the next question, um, how to prevent the 51% attack, like the ones that happened uh, to Coinbase? Uh, what would you recommend to curb such compromises? Um, I, uh, well, on, on public networks uh, where we have proof of work in place, uh, um, it comes down to the hash rate of the network. Um, and when the hash rate of the network outnumbers the financial abilities of an attacker, then the 51% should not happen. I think you're talking about the 51% attack of Ethereum Classic, right? Yes. That is the, the one, yeah. Um, so what, we, what I saw with Ethereum Classic is that the hash rate deteriorated over time um, until it was considerably low so that an attacker could go ahead and buy a lot of hash rate, but the money he had to invest into buying this hash rate, uh, he gained it back by running the attack successfully. So um, I believe that either you have a lot of hash rate, but I think in the long run, switching to other consensus algorithms like proof of stake or even other ones, the problem will go away entirely. There is not, not a question anymore if it's a 51% attack or if it's even possible. And uh, one thing that's maybe worth mentioning, um, if we are running these corporate training events, then we are not talking about 51% attacks because in, in uh, corporate blockchains, in uh, 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 consortium blockchains, you have just a finite set of miners and you cannot just run a 51% attack at all. It's just not there. So these are purely problems of uh, public blockchains with proof of work. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your uh, insights on this. Uh, uh, all right. So the next question is uh, more general, and I think it's something that uh, a lot of people are uh, actually questioning these days. So, in your opinion, do you do you believe that ICOs have a future, and uh, how do you think they're uh, doing against the emerging STOs? I I, I do believe uh, uh, ICOs are an interesting business model for utility tokens. Um, unfortunately, the majority of investors and issuers of these tokens are actually issuing uh, or after uh, security tokens, and there's not utility tokens. There's only a minority of tokens which are really counting as utility tokens, and that's uh, as we see it now with the SEC going after all of these ICOs. Um, that the majority of them are not uh, following uh, the Howey test uh, with the SEC um, offered as a test to find out if your token is a utility token or a security token. The one uh, token where I believe it's a real ICO, a real utility token is Filecoin, where you can use the coin later to buy storage. So um, as long as you follow uh, this guideline that your token is really a utility token, I think ICOs have a future. But I also think that STOs are the one great way to provide securities of all kinds through blockchain technologies. And I think this will be the next very, very large, extremely large wave uh, of mainstream blockchain usage. There are these advantages such as reduced cost or global and instant and secure settlement. And uh, that's just incredible if you think about it where you normally use a, a broker and then all of this uh, goes away with all the intermediaries obviously you need to have some funds in in crypto uh, and not in fiat money to make use of that but that's another story thank you thank you for actually uh, giving a very insightful answer because uh, i truly believe that some of our viewers would uh, really benefit from that uh, in terms of how they go forward with uh, ICOs. Um, so thank you, thank you for that from uh, all our viewers. And uh, this brings me down to the final question. So um, most of the bankers or those who seem to be in power inside the centralized systems are against crypto claiming cryptocurrency, uh, which leads to money laundering. What's your view on this? I think. The stigma is terrible and I think that cryptocurrencies have proven to be far more useful than harmful. I also think that 
blockchains or most major cryptocurrencies are actually a gold mine for governments, auditors, and any law enforcement agencies. I, I, I do believe that most blockchains uh, are open, uh, uh, operating completely open and publicly. And I also do believe that most criminals are somewhere down the road making a mistake so that you can trace them and track them down, which means money laundering um, a blockchain is a very bad idea, but I think the problem comes from somewhere else. Um, I also think that blockchain technologies are very often confused or put equal to cryptocurrencies, where I, I think that blockchains itself, they have a way to transform the way we handle data between multiple parties. And uh, cryptocurrency is just one use case, and I think it's not necessarily the best one. So when you ask me how to transform a banker's mind to uh, pull away the, this argument of money laundering, I would say you tell them about the cost reduction and the increase of benefits using blockchain technologies, and suddenly it will not be a question anymore. Uh, I think I agree with you on that. Uh, well, uh, it, it's more about the benefits that it does add and uh, obviously there is some stigma uh, around it, but I hope that in the near future with uh, the increasing advantages and benefits, uh, all of this would change. And uh, so thank you for your answers and uh, I think this brings us... Uh, to I hope so too. I, we're working on it. <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, on behalf of our team and all our viewers at Wimplo, I would like to extend a very heartful thank you for sharing your valuable insights and uh, your feedback. Your experience in this field uh, could Thanks. help uh, several thousands, if not millions of people in uh, helping to shape the world tomorrow and uh, make it a better place. And for this, uh, we are really thankful and uh, we would love to connect with you again in the near future. So uh, from everyone here at, at Wimplo, uh, a very big thank you to you and uh, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure talking with you. Perfect. I have, um, have a wonderful day and uh, let's connect very soon again. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to another exciting episode of Wimplo News. Make sure you hit that subscribe button below to stay updated with all the latest news about cryptocurrency and blockchain. Please do check out www.wimplo.com. It's me, Kabilan Rajendra, signing out. Until next time, have a wonderful day.